everyone, welcome to Hope City Church. Um, my name is Brent, this is Kendall, and this is our son Grayson. Um, we recently joined and we're also part of one of the life groups. For those of you who aren't part of a life group, we highly recommend joining one. It's really great to just connect during the week and pray together and read the Bible together. We hope that you enjoy the sermon today and the worship and have a great week. Stay safe and we're looking forward to seeing you all when this lockdown lifts. Strong now shaken, we trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. In all your wisdom, in love, and just as you would reign, and every knee will bow. We bring our expectation, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus.
all keeping well. Before we get into the preach, let's have a look at what's happening this week. Our life groups as per usual on Tuesday and Wednesday night and one on Thursday morning for ladies only. We have our prayer meeting happening on Thursday night at 7.30 over Zoom. Please be sure to contact us for the Zoom code if you would like to join. Hope Jen met for the first time in person this past Friday. It was great to be able to connect in this way at our venue again. Please be sure to follow us on Instagram for details regarding our meeting this Friday. And that's it for the week. Hope you enjoy the preach. Greetings. It's my joy to greet you this morning or this afternoon or this evening, whenever you happen to be watching this. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my privilege to take a bit of your time and... and talk to you about the person I love the most, Jesus Christ, the God who loves me. Science, hey? Isn't science amazing? And we have taken great strides in science. At the moment, our scientists are grappling with this virus and trying to find a vaccine that works and is able to be distributed to people. And so much more. My father was always fascinated by space. And when you look at what we've been able to see in space with our telescopes, it's truly amazing. I don't know if you know, but if you go, you can go further and further out, some millions and billions of light years away with what our technology. One billion light years, space looks like a web. One billion light years, it's beyond imagination how far that is. And if you go even further to 10 billion light years, it's, it's called the uniform universe. Or science has enabled us to go into our bodies, into plants and soil, and to go right down, down to the chromosomes, down to the atoms, down to the nucleus inside the atom, right down to things called quarks and leptons and all sorts of fascinating things. It is truly amazing. But yet I ask ourselves today, how does that change my life right now? How does it change my day today? How does it change my feelings, my fears, my concerns with the world as it is? Some would say, well, when I look at science and I look at creation, I see God. And that is so true. I can say with confidence, I see my God. I see my Father who cares for me. I can see his loving hand in the, in the intricacies of my body and the intricacies of space. And he knows me. I know that he knows me. He knows his universe. He knows me. But I ask myself and I ask you today, how well do you know him? So if I want to get to know him, what do I do? Many, many answers to that. But the one I'm going to focus on very broadly today is the Bible. So if I pick up, that's my Bible. It's a lovely, beautiful Bible. I love the feel of it. You can see if I open it up like that, that's the Old Testament and that's the New Testament. Quite chunky, hey? The, the Old Testament is far bigger than the New Testament. And when I start digging into this Bible, what do I find? Well, I see that it's got, there's all these books, books and books and books, and they've all got different names. Uh, some are named on what they're about. Genesis, about the beginning, about the Genesis. Acts of the Apostle in the New Testament, all about what the apostles did in the new church, in the new, brand new church. Many of the books are named after who wrote them. Isaiah and Nahum and all those. And New Testament, John, and, and we read of those. And then in the New Testament, some of the books are named about from who the letter that is being written is going to, Romans and Ephesians. 
And then when I start looking at a book and I start delving into it, I see these chapters and verses. I have to ask myself, did the writers write like that? Did they write in chapter and verse? And I'm sure you know the answer is no, they didn't. We do know that about 586 BC was the first time that the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, was split into chapters. And the reason, the main reason, was they were in Babylon, they were in exile, they didn't have a temple. And they wanted to ensure that they kept on reading God's word. And they wanted to ensure they read all of it. So they divided the Pentateuch up into chapters to ensure that it was covered throughout one year. The Greeks then made certain divisions in about 250 AD. But as we have it, the Bible as we know it, its chapters, was 1227. A man by the name of Stephen Langton. He was a professor at the University of Paris. He later became Archbishop of Canterbury. And he divided up the chapters as we know them today. Verses came about 990, 900 AD. So which testament do you prefer to read? I think most people will say the New Testament. And there are various reasons. It's easier to read. It's easier on the brain. Um, it's all about Jesus. We learn about who he was. It gives me how to live in all the letters that are written by the various writers. It, it teaches me a way of life that is godly and that, that is holy. It's also, it's the new covenant and we're living in the times of the new covenant and many would say, well, I don't really need to know anything about the old covenant. It's not relevant to me today. Some do love the Old Testament, but the sort of comments I get is, Yo, it's so drawn out. Laney, all those blueprints of construction and law after law after law and sacrifice after sacrifice and division of land and genealogy as well. And what's the point? Why has it got all of that? Also, it's pretty gruesome hey, in some places of the Old Testament and the New Testament. More, I think we see it in the Old Testament. There's a woman in jail. She drove a peg through a man's forehead to kill him. And there's so many physical battles and slaying of hundreds and hundreds of people. But of course, the Old Testament has got the Psalms, which I think most, many of us love, love to read the Psalms. I want to take you back to January. Uh, possibly you you haven't listened, but in January, we uh, Glendon, who's the leader of our church, he, he introduced the new vision, the vision for Hope City Church. And it was all about that. He believed God was changing the landscape. My goodness, did Glendon not know how prophetic that was. Our landscape has radically changed, hasn't it? Radically, radically. But in that time, I, I did a preach about digging deep into the Word of God. And I preached from Second Timothy. And I just want to remind us all of the verses, four of the verses that I preached from. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm reading verse 14 to 17. Paul writes, As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learnt it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture. Now, Paul would have been mainly speaking here. When he says all scripture, he would have been talking mainly about the Old Testament. The New Testament, as we know it, had not been put together. The letters and the Gospels were in circulation. They were you know, going to their, their event, to the places that they were sent to. People were reading them, learning from them. But, but Paul here would have been referring to the Old Testament. All scripture is, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete. The New King James says may be perfect. That the man of God may be perfect, equipped for every good work. Timothy had teachers. And these teachers taught him from the scriptures. And these scriptures are breathed out by God. They're not man's thoughts. They are God's letter to us. And what does this scripture do? It makes you wise for salvation. It's suitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. So that you may be perfect, equipped for every good work. That's a broad eye view. So let's just look at the be a bit more specific and look at the Bible, but look at it from a bird's eye view. Because to think about the whole Bible, what does it cover? 
Old Testament tells us how it all began. Creation of the universe, creation of man in the image of God. And man's choice to disobey God and to walk out of relationship with him. And from that time on, we read how God has done everything to reestablish relationship with us. Nothing wrong from his side, but sin on our side. He chooses a man called Abraham. Why Abraham? He chose Abraham. And from this man comes this huge family. In Abraham, though, the first man, we learn that we are saved by faith. In Romans, it says Abraham believed God, believed the promises that God was saying about this new land and you, your, your people, will, you will have generations and generations and people as many as the sand and the seashore. But it, um, Romans, Paul says in Romans that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. It wasn't what Abraham did. It was because he believed what God said. So we learn that salvation is by grace through faith. Then God takes this one man, this family that comes from this one man, and they end up in Egypt because of a famine. And in Egypt, they expand and they expand and they expand and they become a great people. So great that they become a threat and they're made as slaves to the Egyptians and they are in deep, deep trouble. And there's nothing that they can do to get out of that trouble. God provides a deliverer, Moses. And Moses leads his people, God's people, the Jewish people, out of Egypt. He, he gets them, he go, God gets them to put blood on their doorposts, the blood of a lamb that saves them from the death that God brings about on the Egyptians to enable the Jewish people to leave. Isn't that familiar? We are in deep, deep trouble. We can't get out of the trouble we are by ourselves. We try using science, but bottom line, science does not change my quality of life, my inner quality of life, my faith, my fears. We can't deal with that. We try. We think we'll just discover another discovery around the corner, but we keep on being in the same place. We're in deep trouble. God provides a deliverer, Jesus. And by the blood of Jesus, we can find the meaning of life. We can find a deep, deep satisfaction. The Jewish Old Testament and the original Old Testament is almost exactly the same as the Old Testament that I have in my hands today. So they're just, some of the books are put together. The order is different. So the first five books, the Pentateuch, in the Pentateuch, God establishes this covenant with the people of Israel. When you read the prophets, the next big section, he reminds people, this is my covenant. This is what I have done. This is what you should be doing. And then in the, in the writings, which are the Song of Songs, Psalms, Proverbs, all those books, he explains to them how you can get joy from my covenant. So that's the Old Testament. 400 years, God is quiet. Not a word. And then... Unexpectedly, an angel appears to Zechariah, who's in the temple doing his priestly work. And he says, I know you're barren, you're old, but you are going to have a son. And your son, your son John, is going to herald the coming of the Savior of the world. And in, in the New Testament, we read how Jesus came into the world, how he was the long-expected Messiah, promised in the Old Testament. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament religion. He's the goal of the Old Testament religion. The elaborate sacrifice system could now be put away because Jesus became the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. And he's our high priest. We don't need priests anymore. We have a high priest sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us day and night. And the gospel, the New Testament teaches us how a new way of living, a new way that brings life. 
I want to speak about pillars in the Bible. But before I do that, I have found very useful this comparison. Seven things that enable me when I read the Old Testament and read the New Testament to be aware of how God is addressing us. So in the Old Testament, he speaks to one chosen nation. New Testament, it's everybody, people of every single nation. Revelation says every language, every tribe, every people, everyone is included in this. In the Old Testament, he interacts personally, totally personally, but with a nation of people. Whatever he says happens, happens to the whole nation. In our current New Covenant, in New Testament times, which is what we are in, he deals with us individually, very personally. In the Old Testament, their homeland was on earth. Today, our homeland is heaven. Our homeland is not here. We are exiles in the, on this earth. He gave, in the Old Testament, a form of government, a way of living, a, a blueprint on how to live. Now God writes his law on our hearts. The Old Testament, the emphasis is external. New Testament, now internal. My inheritance in the Old Testament would have been the promised land. My inheritance today is heaven. In the Old Testament, my fight would have been physical, slaying giants, conquering peoples. Today, my fight is largely internal, battling with my thoughts, learning about my emotions, learning who I am, how God sees me. So I hope that's helpful in helping you when you read a New Testament book or read an Old Testament book. Go back to this and remind yourself, same God teaching in different ways. So what are the five pillars of truth? I've chosen five. There are many pillars of truth. Just feel that this was what God put on my heart for this time. Number one, God. God is the truth. And he is the same throughout the Bible. A triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He is a God of holiness. He is a God of wrath. He is a God of grace. He is a God of love. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who was there in the cre- at the creation of the world and the universe. The same Holy Spirit who who gave gifts to people in the Old Testament, gifts that they would be able to do specific tasks. The same Holy Spirit who when Solomon completed his temple and the Holy Spirit filled the temple and the people fell down. They could not stand because of, the, of this glory. That same Holy Spirit works in you and me today. That same Holy Spirit gives gifts to me and to you that we might be perfect, as, as Paul said to Timothy, equipped for every, every work that God has for us to do. That same Holy Spirit who sometimes manifests himself so strongly we cannot stand in his presence. That same Holy Spirit who's talking to you and me right now and saying, hear my voice. Push down the other voices. Hear my voice. Love. Love from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. I've heard some people say, well, the God of love only starts in the New Testament. No, God's love pours out through the whole Bible. In Ephesians, Paul says that in love, God chose us. He predestined us to be sons and daughters before the foundation of the earth. And then you can turn to someone like, somewhere like Leviticus and think, you know, Leviticus, who wants to read Leviticus? But in Leviticus 19, verse 18, it says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what, exactly what Jesus said, written way back by Moses in Leviticus. Fourth pillar, prayer. Men, from the beginning of time, Adam walked with God in the Garden of Eden. He spoke with God. Abraham spoke with God. The prophets spoke to God. Oh God, what is going on? Help me. Throughout the Bible, we, Paul prayed. 
Jesus prayed. We read a beautiful prayer. Jesus tells us how to pray. Pray, pray, pray. We need to pray. And then the last pillar I just wanted to highlight today is healing. The same God who healed in the Old Testament, healed in the New Testament, still heals today. In the Old Testament, we can read of people like Naaman. He wasn't even a Jew. And God healed him of leprosy using a prophet, using his own prophet, and because of the testimony of a little slave girl that lived in his home. What about Hezekiah? He was dying. Isaiah had said to him, you are going to die. And he turned to the wall and he prayed and he said, God, heal me. And God gave him another 15 years. Jesus and his apostles miraculously healed many, many people. And he still heals today. Pray to him. Ask him for healing wherever you find yourself. Then finally, for me, I want to give us and encourage you. I've given you the five pillars, but what are five reasons to love this Bible? To want to delve into it. To want to, just as we with microscopes delve into our bodies or with, with telescopes explore out into the heavens. Delve into the Bible. Delve into the treasures of the Bible. Why? To meet God. To discover this God who holds it all together. Even in this chaos of today, God holds it all together. And as we read his Bible, his word, we discover who he is. We learn more about him. And as we learn more about him, he changes, he causes us to change. Secondly, tying on to that, to give insight how to live. How to live in this temporary home. Remember our inheritance, our home is heaven. We're exiles here, but we're here for a season. How do we live? How do we live that we might have life, abundant life, as the, as the New Testament prophet promises? And I read, there's so many verses, but I just picked out this one. Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. And you'll see why I've picked this one. It says, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. Okay, so he's telling us, keep, don't love money. Nothing saying money's evil. Keep your, keep your life free from love of money. Be content with what you have. Yo, we need contentment these days with what we have. But then he tells us how. He says, In verse 5, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's quoting what he said, what God said to Joshua in chapter 1, verse 5. So how do I live free from money? How do I be content? I go back to the Old Testament and realize that God said way back then, I will never leave you or forsake you. I trust that encourages you. But just to go on, verse 6, he says, and so... Because I'm never going to leave you or forsake you, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. And he's quoting their Psalms, Psalms 118, verse 6 and 7. How, one simple thing, of, and there's so much in the Bible, how do I live free? How do I be content? How do I live free from love of money? The Bible tells me. The Bible gives me clues on how to live. Third reason to love this Bible. There are so many promises. Promises that Jesus fulfilled. Promises that are still to be fulfilled by Jesus when he comes back. Promises that will make my life different. That I can be like the woman in Proverbs 31 who says she laughs at the days to come. How can anyone laugh at the days to come in where we live it right now? We can. God is our helper. He will never leave us nor forsake us. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, these things, three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. We need that today. I need that today. I need faith. I need faith that God's in control. I need hope that there's more to it than this. There's more to life than what I'm seeing right now. I need love. I need to know I'm loved. I need to love others. And that's what we find in this incredible Bible. And lastly, Jesus loved it. Jesus, man, God, fully man, fully God, 
loved this word. He always referred to it when he spoke. When you read his Gospels, you discover how often he quotes scripture. And I know I think on this forum I've mentioned before, but one of my favorite, favorite places is where Jesus speaks to the disciples. You're fleeing from Jerusalem after Jesus' death on the cross. And he's, it says he expounds scripture to them and explains exactly why the Christ came, why he had to die the way that he did, why he rose again. What, why else, where else, I should say, should I go? And so I ask us very seriously, very solemnly, a serious question. Do you want to know God? Do you want to know him as a personal God, not this, this impersonal universe. But do you want to know the God who knows you and wants you to know him? And how well? So you say, yeah, I want to know him. But how well do you know him? There's so much to discover. The Bible is never ending source of revelation of this God. I, my prayer, my prayer for myself, for you, is that you will thirst for God, that you will thirst to know him as much as you desire hope in your life, as much as you are fearful in this life. May the overriding feeling be, but I want to know God. I want to know more of God. That's my prayer for you today. God bless you. Thanks so much for joining us for our online church service. If you would like to find out more about us, check out our website, Facebook, or Instagram page. Also be sure to follow us to keep in the loop with our upcoming events. If you would like to get into what God is doing through Hope City Church, here are our banking details. And if you've joined us for the first time, please contact us via email or WhatsApp. We would love to hear from you. Have a blessed week and be sure to join us again next Sunday.